For as long as I can remember, I have been curious about the town I lived in. I was curious about the big name on the water tower that I could see from my window, and I didn't understand why it was spelt the way it was. It ended with a T and it had an L in it, but you never heard those letters. So as an early reading assignment, it was confusing, but eventually I understood that the water tower and the name of the town I lived in was Farabo. And it was pronounced that way because it was a French name, but the man himself wasn't French. His father was French Canadian, but he had never seen France. And his mother was uh, part European and part Dakota. So very quickly, I learned that the world around me was more complicated than the simple spelling that I was being taught in kindergarten. Um, I'm Sam Temple with my uh, producing partner, Logan Ledman. We've been exploring the history of Faribault, Minnesota, and the state at large. It all started for us in 2015 when we started putting together our first documentary for our series, 1855. The first episode was about Alexander Farabo, the namesake and founder of the town. And one of the most important people that we've interviewed and that we interviewed to be featured in that documentary was Sue Garwood the executive director of the Rice County Historical Society. Sue has been a huge presence in our lives and very important to the development of 1855. Uh, leading up to and after this interview that you're about to hear, she has been a vital mentor and friend for every story that we've told ever since that first episode. Uh, so the interview you're about to hear takes place in the historic Alexander Faribault House, which is curated by the Rice County Historical Society. Um, so when Sue references the room around us, we are in Alexander Faribault's bedroom. Um, and uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see just a little bit uh, of the surroundings, but I recommend that you take a tour if you're in the Faribault area. So you can contact the Rice County Historical Society to do that. Uh, but mostly, we hope you enjoy this interview with Sue Garwood. Uh, exploring the world of Alexander Faribault, and I, I, I do, uh, I will remind you, this was a couple of years ago, um, so uh, uh, yes, Logan might have a frog in his throat, but that also might just be the 14-year-old uh, boy trying to uh, sound older by lowering his voice, um, but I still do that today, so we won't judge him too harshly for that. Um, so you'll hear a little back and forth, you'll hear, you know, me moving around with the camera, we were still learning how to do this thing. Um, but Sue was very patient, very understanding, and supportive from the beginning. Um, so Sue, if you're listening to this, uh, thank you for everything. And uh, viewers, we are just so happy to be able to share this full interview with you. And now we take you back in time to the year 2015 in the historic Alexander Faribault House for our interview with Sue Garwood. I think we're good to go. All right. So we'll start at the top. All right. Where was Alexander Ferbo born? Alexander was born in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin in 1806. Alexander's parents were uh, Jean-Baptiste Ferbo, who was a French-Canadian fur trader, and his mother was Pelagie, and she was a Dakota chief's daughter with strong connection to the Indians in Wabasha. Cool. So he has this Dakota heritage and this French heritage. How did that... Uh affect him or shape him, do you think? It was pivotal. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, in When one thinks about the War of 1812, typically you only think about the battles that took place in um, on the East Coast. Uh, in fact, our, our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, is talking about a battle that took place during the War of 1812. But they, the British got in very far into the United States. In fact, far enough down following the river out of Canada, and they burned Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. And what they did at that time is they captured all of the men, and most particularly in our case is Jean-Baptiste Faribault, captured all the fur traders and put them in prison, or actually they tried to press them into the service, as was the British way. Jean-Baptiste refused, and so he was held in prison. Pelagie and Alexander, who was the oldest of their of their children, who was six at the time, and Lucy, 
his little sister, who was four. Pelagie, uh, those were the only two born at the time. Pelagie grabbed Alexander and Lucy and escaped, canoed over to the Indians, her family in Wabasha. Alexander and Lucy and Pelagie lived with them throughout the duration of the war. And so when one thinks about Alexander, it's important to remember his first language would have been Dakota. His second was French. His third was English. And the kinship relationships that he formed during the four to five years that he was with the Dakota from the age of six to ten made a lasting impact on his life and his relationships with the Dakota. So you mentioned Lucy. Uh, did he have any other siblings? He did. He had, um, I believe there were ten in total. <laughs> and um, But Lucy and Alexander being born before the war and then his siblings being born after the war, they were much different. Um, a couple of significant um, in Minnesota history would be Oliver Faribault, who was also a fur trader, and David Faribault, who actually married a Dakota woman and lived more with the Dakota than um, in following his mother's footsteps rather than following his father's. So what was Alexander Faribault's early life like? You mentioned that in the War of 1812 uh, he went to the Indians. Mm -hmm. uh, what other things happened to him? Well, he would have been a you know, a, a typical fur trader's son. Um, certainly early on in Prairie de Chaine, they were building up the community. And so, and both Pelagie and, and uh, Jean-Baptiste were very well respected. So he would have had other playmates and so on. Um, after the war, the Jean-Baptiste, who had been a British citizen or French Canadian citizen um, at the time, became an American citizen after the war and switched companies that he was trading for and began uh, moved with the family to Minnesota in uh, when the British, or excuse me, when the American army wanted to establish a fort to, because again, the British had gotten into Prairie du Chien, they realized how vulnerable this was. And so they wanted to create a fort at the point where the Minnesota and the Mississippi rivers meet that was both about keeping peace between the Dakota and the Ojibwe, as well as ensuring that there weren't other invasions from the north. And Jean-Baptiste and Alexander, of course, and Pelagie and the whole family moved to Minnesota before Minnesota was even Minnesota. It would have been Wisconsin territory at the time. Thank you. And uh, so Alexander Fair moved to Minnesota, as you say. Uh, when did he do that, and what were they doing right when they got here? What were their first experiences? Sure, so um, the, all records indicate that the Faribos had a first encounter and first sort of um, overture to the Dakota in 1817 um, with the full move taking place by 1819. So Alexander would have been 13 years old at the time that he came to this territory. Um, and much of their role was in working with and building relationships between the Dakota and negotiating the treaties to, or working with helping to bridge the gap with the negotiators from the United States, and then work as sort of relationship building and, of course, fur trading, Jean Baptiste continued to be a fur trader, with the soldiers that were in the fort. So um, a lot of his time would have had a, he would have had a mixed time with playing with Dakota who would have been friends and familiar, and you know, the, the, the kinship relationships would have been important. And then of course the soldiers would have come first, but then when officers came with their families, um, had relationships and friendships with those. These were businessmen and they were following the business. As, as with today, they were, um, they were seeking new opportunities to expand. Target's doing that, you know, other kinds of businesses are doing that. And they came to this new land because he had, Jean-Baptiste had been trading in this area out of uh, uh, Mackinac, Fort Michelmack as it was called at the time, all the way down to Iowa and all the way over. So this was familiar territory. It's just that they simply moved the house. Um, and the move was not, again, about seeking new land, but rather business opportunities.
So where in Minnesota uh, did the Faribos live now mm -hmm. that they were there? Uh, did they come straight to southern Minnesota or did they start up north or? Sure. Um, they went right from uh, when Alexander, or excuse me, when Jean Baptiste was released. Um, they went pretty much from Prairie de Chien straight to what's now Mendota. In fact, uh, they established Mendota. When you go to Mendota today, you can see the Sibley House, but also on that same land is the Faribault House, and that's the Jean Baptiste Faribault House. It, the, perhaps most impactful and interesting, I think, is the Treaty of 1837 that uh, gave an increasing amount of land for where the, where the fort is, plus some additional land, from the Dakota to the United States. But actually, two entities got land. The United States did, and Pelagie did. Here's a Dakota woman as one of the first non-governmental entities to own land in Minnesota. And Pelagie's Island is now known as Pikes Island and is a part of a historic site. They lived in Mendota, is the answer, really, and they, or what is now Mendota, and they remained there their entire lives, Jean-Baptiste and Pelagie did. So, uh, Alexander Faribault grew up, became a man. Mm. Uh, who did he marry? Did he marry another person with Dakota heritage? He did, he did. Um, let, if we can step back for just a moment, sure. um, one of the things that we've recently learned is that uh, Jean, uh, when he turned 16, Alexander got what's called a license to trade. I sort of think of it as like a driving, driver's license. He couldn't trade independently, um, but he had the ability to trade, be a fur trader with a more uh, fully bonded fur trader. So that was his dad. So he very early on knew which direction he was going. And at the age of 16 began trading with his father. Mm -hmm. And at the age of 21 became an independent fur trader. So that would have been in uh, 1827. Um, and, uh, but just two years before that, at the age of 19, he had married Mary Elizabeth Graham. She was the daughter of Duncan Graham, who was a soldier at the fort, as well as Hazatwin, or also known as Susan Pension, um, and, who was also of Dakota descent. So Alexander and Mary Elizabeth had the same sort of parentage and understood each other. Um, I think it's important to note that at a time when it wasn't uncommon for fur traders to have multiple wives, Jean Baptiste had only one, Pelagie, and Alexander had only one, Mary Elizabeth, and Duncan had only one, Hazatuin. And so they were they came from a family that is perhaps of mixed race, but of very much what we would consider more traditionalist um, European marriage um, concepts and values. Interesting. So, uh, obviously, Alexander Faribault had a very good relationship with uh, the Dakota around him and uh, the Native Americans around him. What about settlers on the whole and Native mm. Americans? How was their relationship with each other? Was Alexander Faribault's relationship normal or was it kind of an oddity? It's an interesting question. Um, certainly before the 1862 U.S.-Dakota conflict, he would have been uh, really perceived more as white. He was a young man, a businessman. He was a fur trader, um, but he that the fur trade began to wane, and by the 1840s here in what is now Faribault, they were operating a farm. Uh, for, um, sugaring camp and so on. He was also very involved in government because of his good friend Henry Sibley. And he was just sort of at the cusp of change as we went from a territory to a community or land that was open to settlement. And so he too went with that flow, moving from being a fur trader to being a businessman. All right, so back when the fur trade was still um in full bloom. Mm. Uh, you mentioned that Alexander Faribault became a fur trader uh, independently at the age of 21 and got his license at 16. Mm -hmm. Was uh, How did he interact with the fur trade? And by that I mean, uh, how long was he involved with it? Uh, did he like help out his father, that type of thing? Sure. So from the age of six, 16 until he became independently bonded in 21, he was trading with his dad. At the age of 21, when he became an independent bonded fur trader, he was asked to establish 
a fur trading post in this area that had never had a post before. Um, it is now, of course, what we know to be Rice County. Um, he had, there had been a fur trading post in Hastings and one in Mankato, but nothing that split the difference. And so he and a, a friend or a partner uh, loaded up all of their belongings or all of their trade goods on an ox cart. Oftentimes when one thinks about fur trade, you picture the Voyager and the big boats and that sort of thing. And that's true, certainly up north. But down here, it was much different. Uh, they didn't transport the fur in large quantities of goods on the river. Instead, they, were, they followed the river because they knew that the Indians used the river heavily. They followed the river down out of, Manca or out of um, uh, Mendota and uh, following along the Cannon City uh, and then down to where now is Cannon Lake and that's where their first fur trading post was set. They moved the fur trading post around uh, over the next few years, um, one down in Morristown, one way over in Waterville and eventually by 1834 moved to where the Strait and the Cannon Rivers meet, the confluence of those, which is of course again where the city of Faribault uh, grew up. And they remained there in 1834 until really, well, again, as you can see, we're in the Faribault house, so they remained there for the rest of, certainly the rest of the fur trade and a significant portion of the remainder of their lives. Um, the fur trade really began to wane in the 19, excuse me, 1840s. And so that was a part of that. He could tell that the demand was declining. Um, and so began, there was a real push with the fur companies asking the fur traders to buy up land. The fur companies saw the writing on the wall and were pursuing, wanting to become, um, take the development and the real estate opportunities available. So fur traders were asked to buy up as much land as possible as soon as that was possible. So fur trade is, of course, the trading of furs for goods. The fur becomes the currency. And it is the Indians, largely, that were doing the harvesting of the fur and trading the fur for the goods that were being sold by the fur traders. Um, the companies that the fur traders were buying the furs for were then shipping them out east. Most often we associated it with the beaver and for the top hat, but it was all of the fur. Bear um, was certainly one of the commodities. And in fact, um, the, and they were used for soldiers' uniforms. The Queen's Guards over in England have those great big black hats. Those are made out of bear and that bear would have been uh, gathered or uh, f um, traded here from the United States. Um, the leather from the deer and so on, all of the fur were, were wanted in one capacity or another. The goods that were sold by the fur trade are also important to note. Uh, prior to the fur trade, the, there was no cotton, of course, the anything metal. Um, the Indians didn't have access to. And although we oftentimes think about the fur trade as being about guns and weapons, it was also about simple things such as scissors and cotton, uh, sewing needles, thinking about trying to, uh, in, uh, you don't have to think very hard to imagine what it would have been like in the summer, a hot Minnesota summer, you have two choices. Do you want to wear a leather dress or do you want, to, or, or shirt, or do you want to wear a cotton one? Um, you have to trade, you, you have to trade for the cotton, um, but again, are you going to then sharpen a, a bone, perhaps a piece of a rib, uh, into an awl to drill a hole in order to sew a piece of leather together, or are you going to use a needle, in which case it does it all in one, uh, the speed of making clothing and the ease of life. Uh, I think oftentimes we forget that um, the fur trade was also about convenience. Just as today's advancements in technology are about convenience, so too is the fur trade. There were plenty of horrible things that happened with the fur trade, and I think that's important not to gloss over. But the fur trade was, for a long time, quite beneficial to both parties. So after the fur trade went away, you mentioned that Alexander Ferber became a businessman. Mm -hmm. uh, what other jobs did he have? What became his, his role? Sure. Um, so 
perhaps it's safe to say that one of the very first things that he became was a town founder. Um, this community ex is named Faribault for a very good reason. Again, he was here as early as 34 with a permanent fur trading post. Um, he became a farmer and had a sugaring camp here in the 1840s. And the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux in 1851 was the treaty that transferred um, almost, I think it's something like 95 million miles, square miles? That number we're going to have to double check. But the Treaty of 1851 transferred an enormous portion of land, pretty much all of southern Minnesota, from Dakota to the United States government and opened it up for settlement. Took a little bit of time for the language to, for the treaties to, uh, so it's just not only the Traverse to Sioux, but the Treaty of Mendota, those two are both 1851. And it took a bit of time for the language to make its way through the government to be ratified. And so the earliest settlement available here um, would have been in 1852. And Alexander was here ready to buy land. So developer, real estate agent, and town founder is really among his first businesses. Oh, well, farmer, maple sugar <laughs> seller. Uh, um, but once the town was established, once the legal paperwork was in place that this was all going to happen, he also began looking around thinking about what did his town want to look like. Um, so he helped, he was a philanthropist as well. Uh, he was a banker, of course, and he, um, he was a miller. He um, owned and operated one of the very first flour mills and sawmills here in town, but he was also a philanthropist. He wanted um, this to be a place of learning and of significance, so he donated land and money to um, I, the Catholic Church. He was, of course, Catholic, but he also donated land and money to the Episcopal Church. Um, Shattuck St. Mary's, for example, had started out as just Shattuck, had started out as just a small church in what's now Central Park, or small school church in Central Park. Alexander gave land to move and develop the Shattuck to more significantly up on the hill. Bishop Whipple is here, was here in Faribault because of Alexander. Alexander, he, Bishop Whipple was elected in 59, 1859, and when he came to Minnesota, he began looking around where's the best place for him to establish his, his cathedral. And Alexander said, well, pick Faribault, we'll give you land, and here's some money to make that happen. So Alexander really put all of his investments and much of his time and skill and thought into creating the Faribault that was really the, the center of, of education. It was at one point in time called the Athens of the West, where it was a center of culture and education and so on. Perfect. Now, um, you mentioned uh, multiple treaties. Uh, Alexander Faribault was half Dakota. He was half European. Mm. Did he have any interest in those treaties? Like, uh, did he have any role in their uh, formation? Um, Alexander was one of the lead, for, uh, lead translators for the treaties. Um, I know that, that there have been the treaties are complicated and controversial. Um, there are some who suggest that the translation wasn't honest. There are others who suggest that the translation was changed, that Alexander translated what was said, but what was written wasn't necessarily what was spoken. Um, it's, it's very interesting. There was also a certain amount of so Alexander served as, as a translator for both of those treaties, um, one of. There were several translators. Um, it's interesting, there are uh, many look at the amount of money that Alexander was paid. Uh, he received $20,000 for his role in the, both, well, two things. He received the money for his role as a translator, but more than that, he received his that fund because um, the much of the fur trade had happened on credit. That was part of the problem, is that um, the Native Americans would buy things on credit 
trade, um, harvest the animals over the winter, trap the animals and get them prepared for the fur trade, and then pay them, but they might pay a different fur trader. That whole concept, they wouldn't necessarily go back to the person they traded with. And so there's the, for some, the natives were saying, but we paid that. And the fur traders are saying, but we didn't get the money. So it's sort of like you can't buy something from Target and return it to Walmart. Um, that sort of thing became an issue. Um, what's interesting to note when looking at the money, Alexander did receive $20,000, no, $13,000, excuse me. Um, but the main Dakota uh, warrior, the main Dakota chief, received $20,000. And... Alexander gave him an additional 3,000 from his 13. Um, again, those kinship relationships, I think, ran deep. Perfect. <clears throat> so, when was Alexander Ferbo elected to territorial legislator? Also, in uh, Alexander was elected in the in the 1851 uh -huh. uh, election. He was actually elected out of Mendota. Because, of course, Faribault didn't exist yet. Perfect. So, Alexander Faribault, he's half Dakota, half European, mm. kinship to both sides. He served as mm. a uh, treaty translator, that type of thing. Uh, did his role as this uh, attract people of uh, all different kinds of diversity to his town? And what was the makeup of the town? during his uh, early days? Um, so when you think about Faribault, of course, prior to the legal establishment of the city, the occupants would have been fur traders and Native Americans. Prior, after that, when the town was officially established and the treaties were signed, um, so the treaties were signed in 51, the land was available for settlement as early as 52, with the major would have been late of 52. Most everybody was not really entering until 53. The town get, didn't get started until 55, 1855 is when it officially became a town. Um, and the earliest settlers were, of course, European. Um, they were or European descent. Um, a lot of the German immigrants were here and you can see that in the brick makers and the masonry around town all the stones and the quarries those were primarily owned and operated by german immigrants um, the beer makers and so on um, certainly though there were plenty of french canadian um, there were uh, and again you can see that in the names of some of the earliest businesses as well as the earliest settlers there were uh, the episcopal and bishop whipple uh, contingency brought a lot of, of folks from the East Coast and um, Anglican or um, UK ancestry, um, a lot of the English and so on. Um, and then of course eventually everyone uh, of one ethnicity or another. But I think it's also fair to say that the Dakota who were here began to, um, they certainly were pushed out. Um, so the movement of the Indians out of, uh, off the land into reservations was absolutely the first step to opening up settlement. It wasn't universally done. Every community or every state seems to have a somewhat different relationship with that. Um, the Minnesota experience is much different, of course, than the Oklahoma experience. Um, where you have tree, tribes that own major portions of Oklahoma territory. Um, here in, the, in Minnesota, that was absolutely the, the protocol that was done, is that treaties were signed, Dakota and Ojibwe uh, were put onto reservations over a period of, of, of decades, and settlers bought land. But the Dakota weren't locked in. The Dakota were given hunting rights, and so there was a lot of Dakota-European interaction with each other. Um, there are plenty of stories in Rice County of very positive experiences between them both. Um, one of the ones that's perhaps most poignant, I think, um, was told um, by um, a couple of folks up uh, in the Dundas area, 
and they tell the story about how John Voigt, was his name, was um, quite ill and had actually collapsed in the farm field. Dakota, a couple of Dakota warriors were off on a hunting expedition and saw him there, um, thought he was drunk, and ignored him, went on to do their hunting. And on their way back through his land, um, or what, what was legally defined as his land, um, they saw that he was still there and thought, well, let's just go give him a hard time. And they approached him all ready to, um, to give him a hard time for being a drunk, um, only to discover that he was in fact very ill through and, and barely conscious um, through um, broken English and sign language and so on. They assessed the situation and communicated to him that they were going to pick him up and take him to Faribault. And they didn't mean the town, they meant Alexander. I think that story speaks a lot about the role that Alexander had in, he was respected by both. Um, this was, in that instance, it's an example of how this house was one of the earliest hospitals. It was a trusted place. The Dakota who knew Alexander knew that he would take care of, he and his wife, um, Mary Elizabeth, would take care of this man and they did. They dropped him off here and he was nursed back to health here in the house. Um, so I think that's important. Across Rice County though the ethnic diversity is less melting pot. Um, certainly near Nurstrand it's a strong Norwegian community. Near um, Shieldsville and Erin Township is a strong Irish community. Millersburg was the Swedish community. Lonsdale was the Slavic community. Uh, Morristown had a big German uh, population. So as is typical of the county seat uh, of any county, Faribault, although began with a, a more, um, a, a less diversified ethnic population within a short period of time, really reflected the immigrant movement into the United States. Perfect. So, we're in the Alexander Ferbo house. Where is this house? This house is on its original, uh, on a, the original location that it was built in 1853. Um, it is right at, well, it used to be right near the river. The river, of course, was moved in 1901, but it's, it is on a major thoroughfare for its time period. The viaduct here in Faribo now, the um, Highway 60 Division Street that goes across the river, that would have been one of the major um, transports to get from, if you're coming from Hastings, you're going to come in on the road in that, on the bluff side of town and you need to cross. There would have been only a few locations to cross and right here near the viaduct, before, not the viaduct so high, but a bridge much lower and in fact a ferry would have uh, been uh, one of the ways to get across the, the river. Um, and we are of course located very near downtown, although it wasn't downtown at the time that it was built. All right, so what were some of, uh, what was the process that needed to be done to uh, turn Faribault into a town and mm -hmm. how did Alexander Faribault uh, go through all that? Um, as with um, many things, it can't be done just by a single individual, although he was certainly the lead. Um, there were many of the earliest settlers um, and residents actually out of Minneapolis that he had been friends with up in Mendota and so on, who came down and who helped form the legal documents that you had to uh, put an initial town grid together, you had to sort of survey the area and map out where you wanted your town to be, submit those legal documents, and then have that be ratified. Um, that would have been done over at Hastings is where that paperwork would have been. But of note, some of the earliest signers to establish the town are, of course, Alexander, but also John North of Northfield and James Shields, as in one of Minnesota's earliest state senators. Um, well, I think the only person to have ever actually served as state senator, United States senator, um, from three states. So General Shields would have been one of the earliest um, residents here and one who made the city of Faribault possible. 
Perfect. Now, um, what buildings was Alexander Ferbo involved in the building of? Um, in 1834 and um, subsequent years until this house was built in 1853, uh, we have evidence and, and stories that they had a number of log cabins. Um, there's indication that they had um, one closer to what's now Two Rivers Park. Uh, right across the street from the fair, from the Rice County Historical Society. There are some that indicate that he had a fur trading post and a smaller cabin down here um, close to where Lockerbie's is today. Um, so he had a number of smaller um, log cabin buildings, but this was the first framed structure, not only in Faribault, and in Rice County, but we actually believe in southern Minnesota, the first frame home. In addition to that, he built a mill, um, and he, I believe, built um, at least one, if not two mills, actually. Um, I think, though, honestly, he didn't build as much as he was a real estate developer and sold land. All right. When, <coughs> excuse me, when was Faribault officially considered a town? Faribault was officially um, granted its status as a town in 1855. Thank you. When did the first train appear in Faribault? Um, train didn't come to Faribault until 1866. Came to Northfield first in 65 and then came on down through here in 66. There had been hope of it being here earlier, but the major um, crop failures and bank crashes of 50, 1857 and 1858 delayed the building of the railroad. What was the fate of the Wapakute? Um, the Wapakute were among those who were the initial, um, what's the right phrase? The U.S. Dakota War, the U.S. Dakota War, they were among the, the braves that were fighting. Um, so post-U.S. Dakota War, the Wapakute were largely removed from the state. Um, we think of those as the ones who resided here in Faribault, and they certainly did prior to 1862, but, um, well, actually I'd say they actually resided here prior to 1851-52 treaty. Um, and the ones that we most typically associate with Faribault, like Teopi and his mother, um, those were actually Metawakatan. They had um, not been here prior to the war. All right. So, as a... Uh, let's go into that Dakota War mm -hmm. of 1862. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this is a really big question, but what started that? Oh, golly. <laughs> I think that the 1862 Dakota War began, the seeds for that war can be traced back perhaps to the earliest settlers that landed at Plymouth Rock. I mean, truly, it's a conflict when one people who believe in manifest destiny and who have a culture of owning land meet a culture of people who believe that the land is theirs to use but not to own. Um, through conflict and pushing and um, I think conflict of culture, um, there were tensions. Um, that's hundreds of years beforehand, um, but in a more sort of crucible kind of way, closer to the actual conflict. I think that major pieces were ignorance, anger, um, that crop failure I mentioned earlier of the 1857-58 crop failure impacted the Dakota that were farming as well, so they had less food. Um, the Civil War had begun, which meant that money was scarce. The, the annuities that the Dakota were rightly owned, owed as part of the treaty were slow in coming, in part because the United States were, was at war. And so not only was money being funneled elsewhere, but physically getting the money to, the United, to Minnesota was challenging. 
Um, I think that there was, um, I think tension had been growing. I think as the, the pressure to try and put a people that had been used to living with plenty of space into compact spaces, increased disease, increased dependence, an independent people who become dependent, um, and then the people upon whom they become dependent get irritated about a, cre a situation that they created. I mean, I think it's a very complex answer, is I guess where I was headed with that. Do you think relations between the Native Americans and the settlers uh, how do you think they were over time as uh, the Dakota War ended and mm. things like that um, One of the contributing factors geographic, you know, specifically to that conflict, I think, can be traced to the German who were settling in that area. Um, and again, their, their culture as, um, as well as the Dakota. I think the relationships were strained prior to that time, um, but afterwards they were volatile. Uh, even if the United States government was done with the battle, the populace was not. The anger, the violence towards the Indians was very much um, vigilante lynch mob kind of violence. Um, although on the books um, for over a century was um, that if you brought in a Native American scalp, um, if a white person brought in a Native American scalp, they could be paid $200. Um, that certainly set up um, anger and tension. There was a lot of fear. Um, people had been afraid of Indians through other anecdotal stories in other parts of the country. Um, and even though they were not um, there is no evidence of any of that happening here in Rice County. Um, after the conflict, there was still, there was a distrust, you know, went off the map. Um, and so there, many of, much of the conversation post U.S. Dakota conflict, after the horrible kangaroo trials, but after that, by 1863, there was, there were a number of Dakota that had defended and even risked their lives to protect settlers. And um, were the settlers came to their defense. And it was very clear that there were upwards of 200 plus who were thought to be friendly and, should, and loyal to the United States um, and should be allowed to stay in the United States. But as Sibley and uh, Bishop Whipple said they weren't safe, um, but they also all agreed it was unfair to make them leave. Um, there's some interesting reports of how it all happened, but as I've been able to glean, at one point in time, by the spring of 1863, Bishop Whipple and Sibley were talking about the, the ones who shouldn't be required to leave the state. And Bishop Whipple said, send them to Faribault, as in the city. And Sibley said, well, that's fine, but where are you going to put them? And Bishop Whipple said, I don't know, but we'll find a place. And he came to Alexander Faribault, who was, of course, not where this house is now, but where his second home was, over where the blind school is now. And um, Bishop Whipple said, what do we do? And Alexander said, send them here, and we'll put them on my farm. And there is where the kinship relationships that had been developed as a young boy played out, is that for the next really 15 years, he helped approximately 80 Native American families get settled here. Um, they worked in his mills um, when in need. He helped buy shoes. He helped pay for education. Um, he helped... Um, in all kinds of ways until he literally became penniless or well maybe not penniless but certainly much uh, uh, quite poor um, and through working in those businesses the Indians were able to buy land and so on so um, the story of how the Indians were treated across the state 
is not the same story as how Indians were treated in Faribault, although there was plenty of tension about that here too. Now, <clears throat> about tension here in Faribault, mm -hmm. was Alexander Faribault uh, strained by the volatile, violent tension between? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, again, I don't have it in front of me, although you could find it in the paper. Um, Teope and Bishop Whipple and Alexander Faribault all wrote letters to the editor about the, the treatment of the Indians and how they need to be, um, how having them here is the right thing to do and what the right way is to treat, you know, how to treat them and so on. And so absolutely Alexander was very pro-Indian in terms of when it come t came time to that argument, very much on the Native American side of treating them with respect. Um, I think it's more significant to look at that in 1860s U.S. Census, Alexander is listed as white. In the 1870 U.S. Census, he is listed as Indian. Um, and I think that speaks volumes about the culture of, of um, distrust and um, labeling that took place after the 1862 U.S. Dakota War. Now, you mentioned that after Alexander Ferbo was doing all this helping, he was mm -hmm. uh, giving all these Native Americans jobs. Um, what was that a factor in causing Alexander Faribault's life to start crumbling? At his... um, it was certainly a factor. It was a financial strain. He is no longer sustaining his family here. You know, he had, he himself, he and Mary Elizabeth, had a number of children, um, several of them who, of course, by 1862 had gotten married and moved away, but a number of them remained still living at home, as well as his dad, uh, Jean-Baptiste, who, having moved down here to Faribault, um, and, I mean, he, he was absolutely financially strained. Plus, again, the volatility of the financial market and um, the milling and crop failures impacting all of that. By 1868, um, 67, 68, he could not sustain and, and his, several of his businesses closed. Um, they hung on as long as they could and in 1875 sold the house and the remaining land both to any Indians that were living on his land as well as to the state of Minnesota which is why the blind school is where it is. Um, and then they left Faribault went over to Elizabeth, Minnesota um, where they tried um, um, their hand at milling again. Um, a couple of their sons and sons families went with them as well. Um, Alexander's wife, Elizabeth, died in Elizabeth, Minnesota, um, just a year after they arrived. Um, and so they were only there for a few years and um, Alexander returned and then lived the remaining few years of his life with his daughter, absolutely penniless and, um, well, again, perhaps not penniless, but certainly a pauper um, and was... Um, was almost forgotten um, while he was alive. And it was upon his death in 1882 that people were reminded of just who he was and what he had given to the community. Do you think it's important to learn the story of Alexander Farrow? I absolutely do. I absolutely I do. And I think it's more than just remember. I think it's to understand, understand who we are and our context. You know, we don't, the culture of the community, the way the roads, the names of the streets that we live on, the, the industries that are here, all of that is tied back to the past. And so understanding the community and what it is, is only possible by understanding its past. So I think that you can't know the place where you live without understanding its past. If you want to see that interview in the context of the greater documentary, you can check out Season 1, Episode 1 of 1855, Alexander Faribault. Thank you again to Sue for sharing that story with us that had, you know, ha had such a huge influence in how we tell not only this story, but how we approach most of our historical topics. So thank you again for the huge influence you've had. Next week, we return to our coverage of North Country. We've pulled back. We've gotten an idea of what the Wapakuta story was like in the Faribault area. We got to know 
Alexander Faribault, the man and the world that he lived in. So now we return to the broader narrative of our North Country next week.